Hi Penny family. My name is Sue Robinson and I've been a member at Penny Memorial for nine years. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 10. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no doubt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of God. Well, good morning. Uh, this morning, I want us to step away from the uh, the Gospel of John, to think for a little bit this week uh, about uh, the text that Sue just read, Romans chapter 13. This Sunday is not only Mother's Day, it's also uh, a Sunday in which uh, churches, some churches, not many, but a few uh, in the state of Maine, uh, are opening this Sunday for public worship, uh, even though this is not in keeping with the governor's uh, declaration uh, forbidding gatherings, public assemblies, uh, of more than 10. Uh, according to their understanding of the situation and the scriptures and the Constitution, brothers and sisters are opening up for worship. We are not. And I wanted not so much to try to convince you uh, on one side or another that the decision we have made is right or the decision that they have made is wrong or anything else, as much as to use this as an opportunity to think together about government authority to think together about Christian uh, allegiance to God and to talk together about why we at Penny have made the decisions that we have made thus far and what some of that might mean as we go forward into the future. This is a time uh, in which not only are churches talking together and not only have I been in many conversations with pastors and church leaders uh, that I know across the state this last week as everybody is thinking together about these issues, uh, but it's also a time in which Christian citizens of the state of Maine, citizens like, like me and like you, uh, are seeing not just in regard to the church and state questions being raised, but questions being raised and debate intensifying about the government response to the coronavirus. And I don't anticipate that that debate is going to go, along, go away uh, anytime soon. We are in new territory. We are in rocky territory. And it is a good time, therefore, for us to think together about what the scriptures have to say about 
uh, all of these issues. So this morning is not in any way uh, an exhaustive take. I'm not going to be talking about the United States Constitution, though that's fascinating. Uh, and, but you wouldn't want me for legal counsel. <laughs> We have others in the church that would be better to talk to. Uh, I'm not going to be going into detail again about what these other churches are choosing to do or why they might be choosing to do that. I just want us to think together about Romans chapter 13 and some of the broad principles that we can be thinking through and praying through and as we uh, continue to navigate uh, this unprecedented, at least in our lifetimes, situation. So three questions I want to answer today from Romans chapter 13. Uh, the first is, why is government good? Romans chapter 13 says that it is. Why? Why is government good? Uh, the question number two, why are Christians outlaws? At least sometimes. <laughs> why do Christians become outlaws? Throughout, from the New Testament time all the way down to today, uh, Christians uh, have been uh, at times at odds with the state to such an extent that they have been declared enemies of the state or outlaws for the state. Why is that? Why is government good? And if government is good, why do Christians become outlaws? And then thirdly, I just want to talk with you about our response here at Penny. Why have we done here what we have chosen to do in response to the coronavirus and the government's response and everything else? So first question, why is government good? Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 1, and uh, through 8, uh, gives us a couple of uh, reasons why government is good. Uh, and let's just think about those together. The, the first is, you know, right from the start of chapter 13, uh, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says uh, that the governing government leaders have been given some authority by God. Listen to verse 1. Again, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's a very strong statement. And again, this is what I believe it's saying, just rephrasing this, that government leaders have been given some authority by God. Now, God has all authority for everything. Uh, we believe God is the ultimate authority for the entire universe. Whether he is acknowledged by everyone or not, all authority ultimately is God's. And yet, this text tells us that God gives uh, uh, government leaders some authority that comes from him and with his backing. So, uh, when uh, my children were younger and before my in-laws moved in, uh, sometimes we would leave our children, my wife and I, to try to go out. <laughs> to go out, and we would leave them with a babysitter. And we would, ask, uh, we would tell our kids before we would leave, listen, uh, the babysitter is in charge now, right? You need to listen to her, okay? So, so you need to do what she says. Now, strictly speaking, uh, the babysitter has no authority in our house or over our children. No natural claim to authority over our home and over our children. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, we have put the babysitter in charge. My wife and I, when, when my wife and I leave and we put the babysitter in charge, uh, she has authority over those children, authority that has been delegated from us, right? And, and uh, receives our backing. So if they disobey her, they're disobeying us because we have put her for this period of time and with certain limits in charge. In the same way, Paul is saying, and the, and the Bible states other places, that governing authorities have been given some authority by God and with his backing. The, the governing authorities have been established by God. Now, it, it, he doesn't stop there. Uh, Paul doesn't just say that governing authorities have been given some authority, but he also says, uh, gives us a hint as to why God has done this. Look, for example, at verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant, for your good. Start there. For, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Uh, Paul says that this authority has been given uh, to government leaders who act as God's servants. The word there, is, uh, the Greek word is diakonos. It's the same word in which uh, in the church we get the word deacon. Uh, it comes from the same Greek word. Uh, so uh, 
it, it's a, it means servant. <laughs> it's, just, it's exactly what the translation says. It means servant, diakonos, deacon. Uh, and in thinking about it in terms of the uh, deacons in the church is, is perhaps helpful to think about this, these different realms of authority in which God gives people uh, authority in order to serve him and to serve his purposes. So this last Tuesday night, we had a deacons meeting on Zoom, a virtual deacons meeting, the deacons of Penny Memorial. And I uh, was on that Zoom meeting, and that meeting was led by uh, one of the co-chairs of the Board of Deacons, Jeff Mills. And Jeff, interestingly, he serves at, in the church as a deacon, uh, a servant in the church, uh, and he serves in the state as a deacon of law enforcement, <laughs> and he is a state trooper. So he is a public servant with authority in the, uh, from the government as a state trooper. And he is a deacon in the church with authority and responsibility in the church. Uh, both uh, given by God certain areas of responsibility and authority and given a responsibility and authority in these realms with God's backing uh, and for the good of others. So Paul says, he is God's servant for your good. Deacons serve for the good of the church. Uh, public servants, that's where this, uh, perhaps, you know, part of where this idea grows out of is out of this Christian understanding. Public servants in the government realm exist, serve, exercise the authority they have for the public good. That's God's intention. And there is good that government authorities do. There is good that God intends government authorities to do. Jonathan Lehman uh, writes in his book on, on government. Uh, he, he lists a couple of the purposes for which good government is given. And uh, I, I'm changing his wording a little bit, but I'm indebted to him for the concepts or for the, the clarity of organization of the concepts anyway. Uh, Lehman writes uh, that there are several good things that government servants do uh, that help the flourishing of society. So the first is to judge uh, for the sake of justice, to judge for the sake of justice. So look at the rest of verse 4. They are God's servants for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. One of the reasons God gives uh, authority to uh, government leaders is to serve him by, by judging for the sake of justice, by bringing judgment. Those who do wrong, those who abuse, who commit violence, murder, theft, uh, bullying, uh, acts of injustice, cheating, right, should expect, should fear, rightly, not only, though first and foremost, but not only the eternal judgment that comes from a holy God, but even temporarily, right now, according to God's own plan, should fear law enforcement, <laughs> should fear government penalty and sanction if they break the law, if they engage in acts, again, of murder, violence, abuse, theft. Uh, the government is authorized by God to judge for the sake of justice. Fear. Those who do wrong, who break the law and hurt others, should fear the government. And this is one of the ways the government serves public servants like Jeff Mills, like Kevin Lully, like, like Linda Smedberg, like, like others in our, in our church who serve in law enforcement. It, this is one of the ways they serve God, is by judging for the sake of justice, or at least being instruments of judgment for the sake of justice. They also, the government also helps to, uh, serves to provide for the peace, order, and flourishing of society. So, David, interestingly enough, David, at the end of his life, uh, writes a psalm. Listen to what David says. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. So this is interesting. David the king, reflecting back, says when one rules righteously, when one rules in the fear of God, 
the effect on others is like sunrise on a cloudless morning, is like brightness after the rain uh, that brings grass from the earth. It's a picture of brilliant light, of flourishing uh, green grass. <laughs> it's a picture of life and health and beauty. Uh, we might say peace and order and stability that comes from right rule, from righteous government. And so government not only punishes the evildoer, but government also can serve to provide for the peace and the order and the flourishing of society. So uh, Joseph, as the prime minister of Egypt, helps prepare the whole nation for a time of famine. So Israel's law uh, that we see in the Old Testament that was enforced, right? Israel's law uh, had contained provisions to care for the poor and to provide for fair weights and measures in the market. So Israel's kings built cities and walls for defense and the peace and safety of their people. So good, or, good government provides for flourishing, peace, order, safety. Likewise, we have members who work in Department of Transportation that help keep our roadways safe. Uh, we have members working in public health. We have a member right now, uh, who uh, Matt Mahar, who is serving on the government task force uh, that is seeking to s help provide the guidelines to businesses that they will need in order to reopen and reopen safely in light of coronavirus, uh, providing for public health and safety. We have members who served and are serving on the National Guard and who have served in a number of other ways to help provide for the kind of just and ordered society in which people, good citizens, uh, can do the good and creative work that builds on and advances a society. And finally, to pave the way, a good government paves the way for the advance of the gospel and the growth of the church. When Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, that he is to pray for kings and all those in authority, he also writes this. Uh, pray for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ. So isn't this interesting? Paul writes uh, that uh, we, you pray for those in authority so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives, so that these, these goods of a just and ordered and flourishing society uh, might pave the way for the church to flourish and to be able to proclaim the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. A, an ordered society paves the way for the advance of the gospel. And this is why Paul says to pray for it. One of the reasons Paul says to pray for those in authority. So Jonathan Lehman, again, uh, puts this well. How uh, He writes this, People must learn to read before they can read the Bible. People must eat healthy food and breathe non-toxic air so they can live, know God, and worship Him. Children benefit by having loving parents so that they can better apprehend the love of God the Father. Do you see, he writes, God means for the stuff of ordinary, everyday life to serve the purposes of salvation and eternity. Good government, <laughs> or rather, government is good. It has been given uh, some authority by God in order to serve certain good ends that God has, such as justice, such as uh, to provide for order and flourishing and advancement of, of society, and ultimately for the proclamation to pave the way for the proclamation of the gospel. This is what the scriptures say about government. It is intended by God for good, given authority by God for good. And so I just want to say a word about that. We are blessed in this church to have members who now serve in different parts of the state, local and state government. Uh, we have members who are front-line responders to all emergencies, not just coronavirus. Uh, we have members with a wealth of knowledge and experience working uh, for the government in many different areas, from uh, law enforcement to the judicial system to uh, 
labor department, taxation, health and human services, education, city government, people who have served and are serving, and I could go on in all of these areas and more. Uh, these are members who have been a great help to the church through many different seasons, and we continue to consult them right now. And to those members, I wanna say thank you. Your work, which is done in service to God, is also used by God to serve us in this state. Uh, to make our lives better. And this is also a reminder that all work done by Christians, uh, all work, uh, paid and unpaid, that is done to serve God and to serve others, is, is good. It matters to God. It helps uh, for the making of the world to be the kind of place in which uh, the justice of God can in some way be seen even uh, though never as fully as on the last day. It makes for the kind of place where good work, meaningful work can be done. It makes for the kind of place in which the gospel uh, can go out and people's lives can be changed for eternity. All Christian work, Christian, all of your work done to serve God and to serve others is, is blessed. It matters by God, it's to God, it is good. In fact, as we proclaim the gospel, we remember that God does, uh, we don't work to get God's approval. We don't have to. Uh, Christ is the one mediator between God and man. We don't work for God's approval. But having received God's forgiveness and received God's approval through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are now set free to work in service for him and for others. Martin Luther said, God doesn't need your good work but your neighbor does. So do good work as unto the Lord. It matters. So this is why government is good. You see this whole picture here. But we might ask another question, and why is it uh, that Christians become outlaws? I mean, particularly because Christians are Christians, sometimes Christians become outlaws. Indeed, many times throughout history, Christians have become outlaws. Why would that be if government is good? And if Paul here is saying, submit to authority. Well, uh, you know, I think you already have a sense for some of that, that while government is intended by God to be good, it isn't always good. That government is often portrayed as uh, evil, destructive, abusive, tyrannical, unjust. Jesus Christ was not only killed by religious, unjust religious leaders, Jesus Christ was killed by unjust governmental leaders, the Roman leaders, under Roman authority, murdered the Son of God. You cannot find uh, a more uh, devastating critique of government authority than that. Jesus Christ died an outlaw. Well, it's not just Jesus. Did you know that this church actually is in a history, has a rebel, an outlaw heritage? Uh, Baptists from the earliest days uh, here in New England were considered outlaws uh, from the government. In fact, uh, Thomas Kidd and Barry Hankins, uh, in their book, Baptists in America, they, the first chapter in their book, Tracing the History of Baptists in America, is entitled Colonial Outlaws, because that is what Baptists were, refusing to, uh, because they disagreed out of good conscience, they disagreed with the established state Puritan church in the colony of Massachusetts. Uh, they refused uh, to be licensed by the state and refused to teach what the state church said they had to teach. And so, uh, therefore, they were beaten, imprisoned, uh, fined. They were Baptist outlaws. And they were actually in a long tradition. Uh, the author of our text, you could say, was a kind of outlaw. There are three commands to submit to the government in the New Testament, Romans 13, Titus 3, and 1 Peter 2. Three texts that command Christians to submit to, good, to governing authorities. And all those three texts were written by two men, Paul, who wrote Romans 13, our text this morning, and Titus 3, and Peter, who wrote 1 Peter 2. Paul and Peter, who were both outlaws from the state at various times during their lives, both of whom uh, were imprisoned, 
both of whom were executed, uh, according to Eusebius, the church uh, historian, the early church historian, both of whom were executed by the Roman uh, emperor Nero uh, as criminals, enemies of the state. So the very men who God used to write uh, that government is good and you need to uh, submit to it, established by God, the very uh, men who wrote that were themselves outlaws. How could that be? Uh, what is that? Well, the, the reality of, is that the Bible also says that while government has some authority given by God for good purposes, uh, our final allegiance belongs absolutely and totally to God and God alone. Whenever the government contradicts uh, God's authority, Christians must, by the very fact that they are Christians, committed to Christ and to the authority of God. Christians must become outlaws from the state anytime it contradicts God's law. One way of summarizing uh, when Christians must, by the very nature of the fact that they are Christians, become outlaws is uh, this little formula. Christians must engage in civil disobedience whenever the government commands what God forbids or the government forbids what God commands. Whenever the government commands something, you must do this, which God forbids. Or whenever the government forbids something, you must not do this, which God says, yes, you must do it. In other words, whenever the authority of the state contradicts the authority of God. And we actually have examples of uh, both of those uh, categories in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Some famous stories from when we were children. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you know that story. We're told in Daniel chapter 3 to bow down before a graven image of Nebuchadnezzar. They were commanded to do something God forbid. And so they said no and were thrown into the fiery furnace. Three chapters later in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is thrown into a lion's den for what? Uh, for doing something that King Darius forbid in the law. He prayed to the God of Israel, which was forbidden. But Daniel would not stop praying to the God of Israel, for God commanded him to pray. And so he was thrown into the lion's den. Uh, whenever the authority of God and the authority of the state conflicts, Christians, precisely because they are Christians, must become outlaws. So now we have a situation in which uh, the governing authorities have forbid us, some would say, to do something that we are commanded by God to do. We are commanded by God to gather for worship. Uh, but for a time now, we are temporarily not doing it because in part, the government has told us that no citizen of the state of Maine is to gather in groups larger than 10 because of the pandemic. Well, how do we think then about what we have done so far and about our response going forward. Why then are we doing what we are doing here at Penny? And the answer I think I can honestly say has less to do about any potential uh, conflict between the command of God and the commands of the state and more to do with our desire to obey the law of Christ it is out of our understanding of the law of Christ at this time, the law of love, that we have chosen to do what we have chosen to do so far. So Paul writes of a higher law, a greater law, indeed the heart of God's law in verses 8 through 10. The law of God is ultimately fulfilled by love. Love, as Jesus told us, for God, seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. It's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Paul writes, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. When we heard uh, about the pandemic and we began to learn about its incredibly uh, infectious nature. When we began to consider how many members of our congregation 
uh, would potentially be in risk categories and endangered by meeting together. Uh, we voluntarily chose to suspend meeting together in worship. Uh, the government did not come and have to lock our doors. We chose to shut them. We wanted to do that uh, though we highly value worship in person. We wanted to do that. We chose to do that. The deacons met and chose together to do that. Uh, because we don't want to do any harm either to our members or to any visitors who might come in or to the public health of Augusta or Kennebec County. In the midst of this ever-changing situation, we have been seeking uh, to do what is best according to the law of love. And we are preparing, even right now, for reopening, but reopening under drastically different conditions. Reopening under conditions that we believe will allow for the safest possible public gathering for worship that we can provide for our members and for any guest who might walk in the door. Uh, this is going to take a lot of work and it's going to change the very uh, substance of our gathering in very significant ways. In fact, as we were talking about it this week uh, on that same deacons meeting that was led by uh, our deacon, our co-chair co Jeff Mills, I have to admit, I found my heart sinking when I thought about what it would be like. I am excited to be together with others. I am saddened at times by talking about what the new form of worship will look like. But I am encouraged and hopeful by what I hear from the deacon board, from other leaders in the church, from the leaders in our community who we are consulting with, who are eager to return to worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Who can't wait to sing together again and to pray together again. And who've missed it greatly. I know I have. But we will be guided in this case, not only by what the government says, but first and foremost by the law of love. We want to do this well. We want to do this right. For the sake of God and one another. So, government leaders deserve our respect. Uh, Christians, however, uh, owe our ultimate allegiance to God. And I might add, in a constitutional republic, uh, have the right to hold our leaders accountable and should do so in all cases, at all times, according to our conscience and convictions, but always with respect. And here uh, in the church, the one law that ultimately governs everything about the way we relate to one another in the church and to our neighbors outside of it is the law of love that puts others before ourselves and seeks to sacrifice our own rights and, and desires in order to serve the needs of others. So, we will be in touch. Happy Mother's Day. And may you now receive uh, this benediction from Romans chapter 15, verse 5 and 6. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward one another that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.